Welcome to The Foundry, where leaders are forged daily. Each week, we investigate themes of leadership, entrepreneurship, and mindset with some of the greatest minds in real estate. And now, the data scientist of real estate, George Roberts. Welcome back, entrepreneurs. Today is your lucky day because we are joined by John Delia, founder of Housing Joint Venture and Green Monkey Builders. John is author of Life, Liberty, and Property, which is the red, white, and blue guide to starting your real estate journey. John is an author, investor, developer, master of improv, and mentor. Importantly, John is one of the leaders of the Detroit Renaissance and also a thoroughly entertaining guy. So welcome to the show, John. Howdy, George. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. All right. Awesome. Well, you describe yourself as a construction cowboy. What does that mean to you? Oh, great question. So, you know, so I grew up in a place that wasn't so blue collar is hands on, right? That's where we, we work in factories, we work with our hands, we get dirty. I grew up in a place where people went to Cornell, Harvard, Stanford, all of these schools, Syracuse, like right away. And for me, my path was not necessarily doing that from day one, although I ended up at a school of architecture. Initially, I got a real estate license at 18, and I worked hands-on in construction as an apprentice from 19 for the last decade. And initially, I found a lot of shame in that because, you know, my trajectory initially, I thought I would go to Stanford Law School and get a JD MBA and all these things to be accepted amongst my peers. But what I realized was, is that there, in my opinion, there was no better experience to prepare me for where I am today, besides being on a job site and becoming a technical expert. And the reason I say construction cowboy, one, I don't know if you noticed in the intro, even though I'm a New Yorker, I say howdy. And two, you know, <laughs> when you look at the boots and the type of gear that construction workers wear, you know, I found myself in these leather kind of construction cowboy shoes and I would be covered in dirt and dust and all the types of dirtiness. And I just began to embrace it and just have fun and realize that here's a privilege that I get. And, you know, in his book, was it, I think it was Jim Cramer in his book, Confessions of a Wall Street Attic or something like that. And, you know, being on the back of a brucking Bronco is kind of like being in Wall Street or in business. And your job is to stay on. So when you see these cowboys get on this big bull, and they're holding on for their dear lives. And we know you're going to get thrown off. It's just a matter of when. And that's kind of the same analogy to real estate. You might get thrown off, you know, but if you know construction, when the contractor says, hey, it's going to cost you more. Hey, we open the wall. It's like, all right, I get punched in the throat. Let me get back up. Let me catch my breath. <laughs> Some more Chip and Joanna Gaines there, huh? There we go. Here, right uh, behind me, that's my analogy of being an entrepreneur. I think about the the fire of entrepreneurship, so the foundry. Obviously, that's a metal casting plant. I'm mixing my metaphors, and I know some people uh, some people are sensitive to that. I met a guy who actually did work in a foundry. He says, hey, you're mixing your metaphors. I said, yes, I'm doing that very much consciously. So love it. Love the analogy and totally get it. Stay on the back of that bucking bronco. Uh, okay, another quick hit, uh, or at least I think it's a quick hit, but uh, another John Delia quote, real estate is brick and mortar, but relationships are priceless. Exactly that. You know, I'm not sure if you've seen recently all the, the AI and chat GPT coming where, you know, right now I can literally type into chat GPT anything I want and it'll spit out an answer. It'll write a paragraph. It'll, it'll make a business plan. And I think... Physical assets are tangible. You know, we think about money, we think about credit, we leverage that those resources to, to control the physical asset. However, some of my best buildings were brought to me by people, not an algorithm. And it wasn't because I had the money, it was because I had the relationship. So I think too often we forget that relationships drive everything, whether it's your tenant relationship, your vendor relationship, your legal relationship, your banking relationship. So as people get caught up in the performas and the hurdle rates and the waterfalls, I just like to, you know, remind people that, you know, that construction guy on the ground, that relationship and that integrity and that respect, that could drive potentially a better return and an outcome than, you know, any physical, tangible good that we have. So it's just a reminder to treat people with, once again, dignity, respect and care. 
And that, you know, it doesn't matter if you're in the suit or in your the construction gear, we're all human and we all want the decency and the respect. Yeah, I love it. Well, you know what? We got to go deeper into construction and uh, specifically Green Monkey Building, which I think awesome, awesome name. Uh, we're going to hear the story about that in a moment. But uh, you do mention that you are a second generation builder, right? But you also, uh, to carry the founding father's analogy a little further, you declared your independence from your father very early in your <laughs> career. So do you want to tell us, take us back a few steps. How did that happen? Sure. So you know, my dad is a, a Haitian immigrant. He was born in a third world country, ex-Marine, then got to see the world, came back to Long Island. Somebody took a liking to him when he was in a, I think he was driving for UPS or something like that. And somebody said, John, I like you. You know, he was the frequent guy doing the routine. He said, you need to come work for me. And initially he was like working, doing what? He's like, you're going to dig trenches for me. I was like, what? Yeah, you're going to dig trenches. But he made his way out of digging trenches. And that was a home builder on Long Island who allowed him to learn construction first. And then from digging trenches, he ended up building homes, particularly for immigrants in communities where on Long Island it was very difficult to foster home ownership for communities of color. So we did a lot of, and I say we living through my father, but changing zoning laws and building new homes for a new market. Fast forward, you know, when I came to Ohio and I remember at 20, I bought my first property and I was working for my father you know, I'm a junior, second generation. And, you know, with that junior, even though I worked my own merit, you don't get much respect sometimes because people think that it's, I think it's called nepotism. So anyway, you know, I remember with my father's guidance, I bought my first home for $6,900. It was a duplex. And I show up to the job the first day and there's roofers on my roof, tearing off my roof. And I'm like, what is this? Who are these people? And yeah, they were there to help me, but my father had made the decision without me. So I had to fire him from that day forward. I said, no, you're fired, buddy. <laughs> like, I love you. But if I don't learn how to get on the Bronco myself, I might not ever be prepared, God forbid, you know, when the time does come and you're not around. So I wanted to do for self. So, you know, when I did kind of spin off the mothership, it wasn't because I didn't learn a lot and I didn't have a lot of access, but ultimately I needed to know what it was like to use my own resources, my own decision-making and to deal with those consequences. And, you know, that led me to just being a heavy construction guy. I didn't really succeed in the first deal, although although I did make money, um, but I did repeat the pattern and, you know, I fairly, I turned out well. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Well, hey, I got to say, uh, the, the only other story I really wanted you to tell is I, I understand that, I mean, you were with your father from a very young age, learning the construction industry and that that you'd sometimes interrupt his uh, meetings and say, hey, when's dinner? So when, I, when's I, lunch? I, or one's uh, lunch, yeah, just sure. Just like Baron, like here exactly. Baron is, he's finally <laughs> sleeping, but look at him, he just wanted food. And that was me, you know, my father had a real estate brokerage, we had a mortgage company in Long Island, and I would be in his office, and it was just like, dude, I'm underneath the boardroom table. There was conceptually or consciously, I wasn't aware, I'm a home builder, he's a home builder, here's what we do. It was kind of like, that was my daycare, that was babysitting, it was just being in his presence and being around. Yeah, we'd be on a job site and there's heavy equipment, but no child says, oh yeah, that, that's our heavy equipment. I mean, maybe some children, but for me, <laughs> that wasn't necessarily the reality. So unconsciously then to conscious, you know, I'm grateful for it. Yeah, amazing. I gotta say just a truly heartwarming American story. And I sort of came back around to what my father did after he was gone. So I ended up going into finance and real estate. So Wow, I identify with a lot, a lot of that. Now, okay, I'm also, by the way, a biologist. So, as a biologist, I know that the green monkey ranges from uh, West Africa, from Senegal to the Volta River, and they're known for their red, white, and blue displays and prehensile tails. But I gather that's not why you picked uh, green monkey as uh, the avatar for your construction company. So great, great segue. I love the um, the research as well. So the, this green monkey comes in origins from the island of Barbados, former British colony. My wife's family of origin, her father was from <clears throat> Barbados, former petroleum engineer. And we got married down there. And, you know, when we got married down there, I remember being on the beaches a few days and these little monkeys were so playful and so fun and they would come up and they would grab your finger and it's kind of like a child who grabs your finger and it's just like there. And ultimately, 
I've always been in a very serious business, construction, development, finance. It's very serious. There's a lot that rides on doing things right. And I recognize that sometimes, and now I call myself a housing provider, but even being the landlord can be a loaded term because not everyone has that privilege. So I said to myself, I'm going to take a serious business and I'm going to make it playful because we like to have fun, even though we do serious work. And I thought about marketing and branding, and ultimately my aspirations are to have a way larger company. And I thought, okay, think about those maintenance trucks when they're driving down the street and there's like a big green tail of a monkey. And it's like, what is this? Or, you know, think about an apartment building and Mm. the maintenance guy comes, but instead of leaving a door hanger, it's a hanging monkey tail saying, sorry, we missed you. And he's hanging upside down. So green monkey builders and green monkey rentals was kind of just the play on how do we you know, how can we have a playful property management and development company that, you know, that is serious business, not monkey business, but still fun. <laughs> <laughs> right. So there is uh, some liability in the name, but I love it. And so that's why I mentioned the prehensile tale, because I knew that was going to come up uh, later in the story. So yeah, if you, if you read about them in the wild, they say, do not approach the green monkey. They will bite. But <laughs> the favorite part of your story is how domesticated they are from all the tourists there, probably feeding them. Uh, probably ignoring dozens of signs that say, don't feed the monkeys. (laughs) But yeah, beautiful story. Love it. Love it. And fun, love and cool, cool story. But so it's not all about having fun though. I know that you're an innovator, right? And you are somebody who approaches this business, not like, well, let me just make some transactions and make some money, but as a real business, as an innovator. So what are some of the innovations you want to bring to building? Love it. And I, I think, thank you for that. I'll Clayton Christensen's and RIP because I know he just died in the last two years. But when you think about the book, The Innovator's Dilemma, you can come from a large scale institution, but too often it's too risky to innovate internally. And part of the reason is, is when you think about, let's say, publicly traded companies with earnings calls and quarterly goals, you're not going to sacrifice your job off of a new ambitious project or initiative. Part of before I spun off from my mothership, my father's company, you know, I went to school, I had education, I was reading 10, 20 books a month, and I wanted to implement some of the new knowledge that I had acquired. However, the old world conservative guy in him said, hey, I've been doing this for generations, my dad's at least 30 years older than me, and he's like, I know you know a lot, but I know more, so we're not doing all that stuff. (laughs) So for me, I really wanted to be able to implement what I had been learning. I think that construction and real estate, I call them old world businesses that are ripe for innovation, but I think it takes the subject matter expert, it takes the construction cowboy to bridge on the ground with technology and with strategy. So for us, when we look at building systems, when we look at construction management, when we look at project management, there's a lot of opportunity to digitize and to bridge kind of the office with the job site. So really for us, you know, I don't want to use too many buzzwords, but I think that there's an opportunity to leverage BIM, building information technology with other software to not just streamline the process, but to create more transparency. And really quickly, because I know this is long winded, I've been raising private investment capital for a decade. And part of the reason I was able to do so is because I was really strategic about documenting every aspect of my projects from before and after photos, to receipts, to the strategy, to the plan, ultimately to leverage it as credibility. And I remember when I went back to Knowlton School of Architecture, I wanted to formalize my thesis to show it was scalable. And ultimately I tell people, when you go and buy a property, let's say with a construction loan or a 203K, you get your equity, you use your credit, the bank says, hey, go find a contractor so we can give him money. And he gets draws on a, on a schedule to go do that renovation. Well, when you invest with a syndicator or a self-directed IRA, the moment I sign those documents, I'm wired a lump sum of funds and it's the black hole that you better perform. And I tell people that in construction, one thing is fixed. And, and I say fixed with inflation is which is the cost of goods. We can quantify the takeoffs and what's necessary in terms of those inputs, But what always fluctuates is the labor. So one thing we wanted to do was be able to to create light in that black box, which is the construction sinkhole. So how do you create transparency in that process? So that if I say, George, I want you to invest with me, the money goes into an escrow account, 
There's transparency through software, through documentation. And we know that John is not using the money or leveraging it for misappropriating, but it's really maximizing those funds. And in doing so, hopefully that makes me a better candidate to take on more resources and do larger scale projects. I love it. Yes. And if you're wondering what passive investing is, if you're new to this show, I do have many, many episodes about that. Definitely something you want to look up. Oh, and here's one more thing you might want to look up because I can't tell you the story of the red, white, and blue display of the green monkey on this show. So if you're interested before we uh, leave construction, definitely going to have to look that up on your own, but amazing. I feel like we're probably not even going to have time to talk about a uh, housing joint venture, one of your other ventures. And I love to talk about all of my guest ventures because that I think is, is also a very, very cool thing, but yeah, integrity transparency, just literally avoiding the appearance of evil, making people understand every step of the process. It is a very opaque process, right? I'm speaking here behind a like a largely black background, right? I mean, <laughs> that's how I feel. People think it's, uh, you know, uh, passive investing. So I wire my money into this black hole and then uh, it's supposed to come out the other end uh, when? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's see. Mentorship. This is one that I feel like I can't skip because I'm fascinated by mentorship programs, probably because I never joined one. You once stated people pay me thousands of dollars for education isn't necessarily the best use of funds. You could put those funds to a deal and the best way to learn is hands-on, right? But you do offer a mentorship program where you're sort of giving your systems, the processes, you're showing people what success looks like. So tell us what does your mentorship program look like and how do you differentiate it from all the tens of thousands of lookalikes? Kind of like that, you know, hey, wire me tens of thousands of dollars. It's going to go away, but I promise you're going to get it on the back end. Literally. So, George, thank you for that. So coaching is on pause for now um, because, you know, as an entrepreneur, as a business, you have to have focus and clarity in the revenue models and the revenue streams. And I'm at the point in my career where I do believe that paying tens of thousands of dollars for a coach is better used in a deal. However, Previously, they say that when you teach, you learn the material better. And for the most part, I had written a book, you know, I was giving a lot of people mentorship and, you know, I would have older people with young mentees say, Hey, talk to John. He got into it. Or I'd have corporate professionals come to me and say, Hey, I want to be like you. What do I do? So I think that we, I started and we built a boot camp for the purpose of um, scalability and not repeating myself over and over and over again. So, you know, I had the Life, Liberty, and Property book. I had a blog for a long time. I was a financial writer on all these sites. But it was just to help people have a repeatable process and system. Ultimately, I wanted people to take responsibility for their, their actions. What I mean by that is, is, once again, back to the stigma of being a landlord or a property owner. And you'd go to some of the meetups and you'd hear about the horrible tenant and how they destroyed the property. And I say, guys, not only did you have the resources to buy your own house, but you bought another house that somebody else could live in. So it's your responsibility to vet them, qualify them, and ensure that the system is going correctly. And it's kind of like training an animal with conditioning. So I didn't, I didn't want to let people push the blame on others. I'm losing who said it, but the buck stops here, former right. president. And Truman. it's taking, Truman, yeah, take responsibility. The buck stops here. So I was leaving kind of a roadmap so others could follow. Um, our clients ended up being engineers, MBAs, corporate professionals, as I mentioned, and it turned into a, a boot camp over, I think it was eight or 16 weeks, video modules. But not only that, you would get all our systems. My lease, believe it or not, 50 plus pages. And I know it sounds ridiculous, but we were managing hundreds of units in apartments. So nobody thinks about a waterbed clause or a bed bug clause or, a, you know, tires flat in your parking lot clause. And once again, when you look at the responsibility, my family specialized in turning, you know, distressed large scale apartment complexes into decent communities. But to do that, the systems and the infrastructure and the image was important. So no different than, let's say, a hotel franchise that Marriott says, George is upset at the front desk. Go to page 23 and offer him a courtesy X, Y, Z. So just the SOPs, the standard operating procedures, the systems, and not just that, the mentality and the mindset to be a problem solver, to overcome the barriers, the hurdles, et cetera. But as I mentioned, what we've done now is transitioned into what we call a managed joint venture. 
And it's basically developer or developing with training wheels. So, you know, that same level of resources and credit, we can now do a joint venture in a single family or in a multifamily, and you can get access to the back end, the operating, the QuickBooks, the systems, but you're actually helping with the, the strategy and the decision making and that day to day aspect so that you really tangibly feel it. Because what we found was, is, and, and maybe it's just my own bias, I didn't feel comfortable that a person would graduate the program, but then six months later, they hadn't done a deal or they didn't transition. And, and I think that's ultimately like success, no different in college. You want them to get the degree, then get the job. So for us, I don't want to just teach you. I, the success is we've helped dozens of people own assets. And that's really, you know, what coaching was about. I love it. I got to say my own experience with long leases. Now, I thought my, I think I've got like a 12 or 13 page lease. <laughs> uh, my sister, credit to her, uh, she put that together. We we had some discussions, but really it's it's credit to her. And I thought that was long. It reminds me of a great Michigan investor. I'm not going to mention his name, although it's it's not in any way a negative story. Sure. But, uh, but landlord, you can't keep chickens on the property. Tenant, where in my lease does it say that I can't have a chicken? Landlord, good point. George? That's where my first pet chicken, Sophie, came from. (laughs) (laughs) Had immigrant tenants who were refugees, Section 8 have contract. And I remember I was the maintenance guy. So I got the call. There's a chicken running around. Somebody has to catch him. And it's not like a stray cat where you can just release them to a humane society. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I've heard that they are good pets. I mean, they eat bugs and stuff. I mean, you just put them outside. You've got some grain. I mean, they're pretty self-sufficient. So uh, great. Yeah. I love so, it. Yeah, I was about to ask, do you have any real. crazy tenant stories? And then John brings up the chicken before I could even say it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you, this is why I saved the time. Because look, I want to enter the most challenging section of the interview. I call this the seven. Okay. So this is the section of the interview where I ask you a series of seven high impact questions in rapid fire format. Are you up to the challenge, John? Let's do it. Here we go. All right. If you could be known for only one thing, what would it be? Impact. I want to impact at least 10,000 people. What is the greatest lesson in leadership that you have learned as an entrepreneur? I have to look in the mirror and reflect on my actions and my role modeling and my modeling so that if there needs to be adjustments in the leadership or the, the behaviors of the people following me, it's up for me to model and you know be that character first and foremost. What personal characteristic has been most pivotal to your success? Curiosity. I'd like to tell people that my thirst for hung, I mean, knowledge is sometimes unquenched. So it goes under the notion of no stone unturned and consistently learning, 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 and being curious as natural as you can. Love it. As a scientist, I got to say, that's my top characteristic. Mm-hmm. And this is where we take it up a notch here. So John sees the random question cards here. He knows what's up next. Okay, so speaking of Truman, okay, or maybe I'll stop for a moment. I actually went to the Truman White House in Key West, and he was a great big card player. So that's where the the buck stops here. Now, I'm not a card player, so I didn't actually know what a buck was. I knew the quotes, but he actually, you know, it's it's illegal, or it was back then and uh, maybe still now to, to gamble. He was actually gambling money. And so he had this table, you'd take the top off and it was like this little mafia gangster thing. You take the top off and he's got this gambling table there. So <laughs> he, could, he could put the top back on and uh, you know maybe he has some foreign dignitary over there and uh, look all serious. And then in the evening, break out the whiskey and, and take the top off. Uh, boys were playing cards. <laughs> I just learned something new. Now I use that analogy and I know the root of it. I'll have to go back and watch the story, but thank you for that. All right. So here we go. Just tell me when to stop cutting the deck. Sure. Okay. Stop. All right. Top question. If you didn't have to worry about money, what would you do with your life? Oh my God. Normally I would ask other people that question to be honest with you. And this, I mean, I want to build skyscrapers. If I didn't have to worry about money, I would build skyscrapers. 
I would build beautiful, architecturally significant towers. You know, it's just my thing. Awesome. Name a book that's helped to forge you as a leader or as an entrepreneur and why. I'm thinking about three. I mentioned one earlier, so I can't repeat that. You know what? I'm just going to say it. Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. You know, that book, it took me three cycles before I read it. Over a thousand pages. They say it's the second most read book after the Bible. Who knows if that's true? But I think that the principles in that book, although Ayn Rand is known for like, you know, the virtue of selfishness and, you know, being about self, I think that the underlying principles are actually underpinning rhythm altruism and helping others but before you can do that you have to take care of oneself love oneself and and produce for oneself so i just think about you know who is john galt and the representation of that book and you know i think that book really has impacted my life significantly awesome and you know what i must be channeling you today because when you said you wanted to build beautiful skyscrapers i'm thinking howard rourke from the fountainhead so <laughs> howard rourke i know and guess i was just howard feeling did. this Ayn Rand thread coming. Howard through. needed to work construction when he needed money and he would <laughs> sw swing the hammers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, oh. Describe a failure or a misstep and what it taught you. Sure. I'll go back to the first property. I remember, you know, I bought this house for $6,900. Young, ambitious kid fires his experienced father rather than just getting a home run. And within 30 days, I'm sitting there running out of money. I was paying for the house out of pocket. I was getting taken advantage of by contractors who knew I knew nothing. And I got really scared because I remember Brenda was moving in and her two adult sons were helping her and the house wasn't quite finished. And I was kind of just scratching my head, scrambling like, oh my God, this is serious. I thought investing was just buying a property, but you actually have humans who live in the building and you're responsible for their well-being. And I, once again, reality, it's like at 20, I was naive. So breaking the fourth wall and recognizing the significance of your leadership, your responsibility. So I ended up selling that building. The guy across the street, Michael, was an investor. He owned a trailer park. It was half a block like my building. And Michael was helping me. So he offered me, I think, a little over 10,000 more than I had into it. I made 10 grand in a month. But, you know, I would say I failed and it was a gut check, but it propelled me to not quit and to try it again. Can you send us out with a quote to forge our listeners as leaders and entrepreneurs? Robert Moses, those who can build. All right. And so just one last, this is our bonus question. How do our listeners and viewers reach you, John Delia? Awesome. You can reach me on LinkedIn, John Delia Jr. I use the junior. I find that LinkedIn is probably my best platform. I've kind of gotten rid of all the others besides Twitter. So, you know, I'd love to see you on LinkedIn where you could easily find me, message me, and we could have a conversation. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and experience with our audience today, John. Thanks, George, for hosting. This was a lot of fun. Thank you.